Trust, the most powerful force in the universe. Chapter 1, The Secret of the Sperm. I want to begin this book by explaining the ultimate discovery for prosperity I have demonstrated from experience. Also, I will humbly tell you something that needs addressing before we start. As I sit in this recliner chair and turn within for the right words to say, my fingers typing away, I trust that the best transmission is coming through for you. In other words, the entire process of writing this book is to give of myself entirely to this moment. Please do the same as you are listening to this. Perhaps it will be just a few moments at a time, pages, words, etc. Or maybe you're like me and you will open what appears to be a random page if you have this book. Nothing happens by chance in a perfectly ordered universe. You can read whatever grabs your eye if you have this book in your hands. If you're listening, then just follow along. Trust yourself along this journey together as you and I begin communicating on deeper levels through what appears to be words on paper or in my voice. Amid the thought images, you will bring to mind a new perspective on many occasions. This new perspective is the opening of a new dimension of consciousness transference from me to you. The knowledge you will receive has inherent organizing power and will integrate itself like seeds sown in fertile soil. Therefore, you need not try and concentrate too hard if something does not make sense. New matrices will form in your computer brain and you will begin noticing new realms of possibilities that have been forever present, awaiting your recognition. I will include a personal story and a recommended video to watch within each lesson I share with you. In this way, you can grasp the profound revelation and wisdom will be the reward for your diligent effort. There are two ways to learn from our human experience, mistakes and mentorship. Mentorship leads to success without the weight. What wisdom I have picked up along the journey that has led me to trust the flow of life 100% can be of immense value to you, especially now in the current world situation. So let us begin. I am sitting by the heat vent after a cold sprint session outside Lake Michigan, and for all practical purposes, I had to get relaxed because the topic at hand, the secret of the sperm, was discussed at great length by the Neville Goddard Library, and this is not to paraphrase his work. Instead, from my wisdom, I shall share with you how this big idea has endowed me with millions of dollars flowing through my companies. To achievements in every area of my life, I have achieved every goal aside from one that I gave up on. That I ever set using this seed faith principle that Neville describes as the secret of the sperm. However, my beliefs differ on a few topics from Neville, such as tithing and a necessity for action to produce optimal results. I want you to write this little sentence down and remember it. Creation begins at arousal. Creation begins at arousal. Whether you refer to the woman who carries the baby in the womb for nine months to the new business launch, arousal is the place to consolidate your focus. I am suggesting that you make the goal that you are setting about the experience of joy and not the temporal illusion of an achieved result. In other words, like the late Reverend Ike said, feeling, <clears throat> sorry, feeling gets the blessing. Make your new habit about living your expression of activity in this world from being rooted in a perpetual place of joy. Your quality of action is the seed sown. I repeat, your quality of action is the seed sown. The vibrational state you occupy determines the resonance of frequency in your attractive state. Sexual energy can be used benevolently and transmuted to create anything you desire on the material plane. The world system attempts to pervert this energy 
and destroy its potency for propelling oneself into self-mastery. We pick up guilt and shame every time we misuse sexual energy in a way that defiles our highest good. The porn industry and modern culture have destroyed sacred values our Creator designed to keep this power in place for you to prosper in all areas of your life. I call these false start ghettos because they siphon off our creative force into the dark abyss of self-punishment. True story. When I first began using sexual energy to manifest, I was not even 10 years old. It all happened because I never forgot how to use this power. I entered the world in defiance to conformity since day one and lived in my imagination almost all the time. Adults, religions, and false authority in this world are good at corrupting us as we grow in their pseudo-knowledge. I avoid these traps at all costs. As a young boy, I would fall asleep in class and daydream about the prettiest girl and how it would feel to win her heart. Little did I know, but I was using the process I now call the ABC break process. Adding a muse is like putting it on steroids. If you have not used this technique, do not rush away and learn it before listening to this entire lesson. Ironically, Billie Jean was her name. I chuckle because I did manifest my dream girl only years later. Sabrina Jean is my present wife, and she has many of the same characteristics. Billy was a tomboy, and she did not like me at all. She was afraid of me because I was a mean little guy that flirted by picking on the girls. I was clueless that my macho hockey attitude was not very loving. That part sucked because I daydreamed about Billy and me quite often. She did not reciprocate and long to be with me in the world quite the way I imagined it would play out. Again, I'm laughing inside because neither did Sabrina. She tried to run away from me for months before we were officially dating. The lesson I learned about using this power is essential to understand. First of all, you cannot use black magic and cast upon others your human will and expect them to comply. You should never try and outline how or who is involved in expressing an innate pressure to experience a desire. Second, because Billy was the muse that inspired me to go within my imagination and stimulate arousal, this electric energy poured out upon my sackcloths that became filled with the finest gold. These newly imagined ideas, sackcloths filled with the finest gold, are the garments that we clothe our inner world within our imagination. Later in this chapter, I will explain the winter and summer seasons as they pertain to you manifesting consciously. This excerpt from the Gospel of Philip in the Nag Hammadi Library is important. In this world, those who put on garments are better than the garments. In the kingdom of heaven, the garments are better than those that put them on. The kingdom of heaven is your living imagination, the Christ. Herein lies the mystery of the sperm and egg. It is the electricity of spirit seeking expression as it curves back within itself, expressing to itself those images we hold in our heart. Meaning, we pour out intense emotional energy on the ideas we are clinging to in our imagination. Reversing truth or harmony, Satan binds mortals by flashing outer forms of terror, disease, lack, limitation, strife, disharmony. Satan, or fear, that's another word for Satan, can only create by deceiving us to bring graven images into our inner kingdom, the living imagination. When we willingly do set our minds and hearts upon evil, perhaps from observing social media and some idea of tyranny, conflict, disease, lack, and poverty, we sin in blasphemy. Satan only gains power from within ourselves. We submit to temptation 
by a suggestion that two minds exist, good and evil. The original word for God is the good, and he shares power with none other. When we reflect on images, thoughts, and ideas that disturb our peace, we break the first two commandments. Put no other gods before me and have no graven images. Once we accept ideas from wicked and crooked beliefs about life in eternal good, hence Hollywood, Druid, sorcery, and bring these defiled offerings before the Christ, our living imagination, we blasphemy. In truth, God is all in all. No space is without his presence, power, and mind. Therefore, the man on the earth is drunk in sin and blind, reaping what he sows as he contemplates discordant ideas. This offering of wickedness is what blasphemy is, and it is the only unforgivable sin. Drunken mortals take the beliefs of evil sorcery and fall into Egyptian bondage and slavery. Adultery is when you spread satanic ideas, or fear, as your seed offering, and therefore you must suffer the consequence. Here is another excerpt from the Gospel of Philip, Philip in the Nag Hammadi Library. <clears throat> Every act of sexual intercourse between those unlike each other is adultery. Religious charlatans that hijacked the gospel and twisted the original teachings to usurp control over people by saddling them with guilt and fear taught adultery differently. This scripture in Matthew 5 verse 28 has mentally castrated more men and forced them by repression and the consequent perverted expression into false start ghettos from food and drug addiction to pornography. <clears throat> but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Sexual energy is the most potent force man possesses for creative expression. Every time a so-called believer of Christ has a sexual thought of a woman, he assumes shame and guilt. Anytime shame is associated with an action, that action will repeat until the shame and guilt are gone. The original meaning of adultery is vastly differing in interpretation according to a Gnostic mystic. Every act of sexual intercourse between those unlike each other is adultery. That's what the scripture says. The root word of sexual derives from sakar, to divide or cut. The root of the word intercourse in the mid-15th century means communication to and fro. Now, adultery means that a person has become divided, unwholeness, unholy, for lack and want, and is communicating to and fro between the inner and outer kingdom. Revealed, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her means a state of wanting or lack for any good thing. The inner communication from the outer realm, a belief in superstition of matter, produces discord and disharmony within the emotional heart of man. Unlike the inner kingdom, the outer kingdom is a barren place and cannot create representing effects and not cause. Before skeptics assume it is okay by me to fornicate or sleep with someone else besides your partner, it is simple to say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, clears this up. I have sinned many times, and it boils down to breaking the most basic of all rules. For what blesses one, blesses all. Also, what hurts one is what hurts all. Let unselfish love guide your actions and prosperity will be the result. Let selfish desire, the expression of lack, rule over you and you will squander your good. If you recall, Satan tempted Jesus by offering him the world. Jesus said in Matthew 4 verse 10, 
Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Look at this as a cipher. You disregard the outer realm, the aeon of the rulers who cast spells to bind and deceive. You turn within to the living Christ and put all your trust in him instead. Growing up, in my daily fantasies that I would fall asleep in, as Neville Garda describes, I was putting into works the highest form of prayer. The human imagination is the living Christ, and the outer world of material form is an empty dead carcass. According to the Gnostic teachings, until man rises in this knowledge and lays down his former life, he remains bound by sin, Satan, fear. It was my utter disdain for the world I found myself in that forced me into the Christ power as a young boy. I always followed the same pattern and always manifested every single dream I would set my inner sights upon achieving. First, I would choose a muse and activate a potent, attractive force of emotion and desire. Second, I would occupy that energy state by expressing that desire in the now space where all exists. I do this by imagining the desired achievement and living out being that person now as the source of this vibration pouring out from my inner kingdom. Using this strategy, I instinctively applied what ancient mystics referred to as sowing in the winter season to reap in the summer. Consequently, the word sperm means to sow or seed. The entire outer world operates on the seed faith principle. What you sow, you reap. Let us now carry this deeper for your gnosis to attain a self-mastery level. You will gain the wisdom to deprogram yourself from maya or illusion from the outer kingdom. Unless you pierce through the veil and walk by faith and not human sight, you remain blind. You must end the blasphemy where the graven images in the outer are offered within in front of the Holy Ghost, the imagination. Until you know that the outer aeon is an empty dead carcass and governed by the rulers, archons, who hold you captive in the middle place, the reasoning mind, you are ignorant of the Father. Whoever remains deficient till the end is a creature of sin. Now follow my thought as I describe the aeons. Winter implies a place that is barren of life where sustenance cannot grow and sustain living organisms. Winter is the outer aeon, or realm of material fashion form. It includes the ideas of this world and your human idea of being contained in a material body. If you think you are bone, blood, muscle, brains, heart, lungs, eyes, and every other pagan ideology, you are dead on the cross. That is why you have a birth certificate and a nom de guerre. It means corpse, corporate person name in all caps. As Morpheus describes in the blockbuster hit movie The Matrix, it is the world pulled over your eyes. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, discovered this and was able to heal tens of thousands of people and teach others to do the same. Regardless of what the naysayers criticize her for, I would surmise most of them are misguided where they could not experience a miracle if they were living and breathing inside of it. How do I know? Because as Jesus described in the Gospel of Thomas in the Nag Hammadi Library, verse 29, Jesus said, If the flesh came into existence because of the Spirit, it is a marvel. But if the Spirit came into existence because of the body, it is a marvel of marvels. But as for me, I wonder at this, how this great wealth made its home in this poverty. Since the scripture is alive now and forever the same, here is what Jesus had to say about the wisest of men on the earth in the Gospel of Truth in the Nag Hammadi Library. Jesus as a quiet guide. Jesus became a guide, quiet and at leisure. In the middle of a school, he came and spoke the word as a teacher. Those who were wise in their own estimation came to put him to the test, 
but he discredited them as empty-headed people. They hated him because they really were not wise. Summer implies a place where life is thriving, and growth with sustainability for living organisms is taking place. Summer is your living imagination or the Christ. As you read in the Bible or heard your Sunday school teacher tell you, Jesus Christ overcame the world. The perfect analogy to describe this is the little child who has a stick in her hand while pretending to wield a sword and slaying evil dragons. In her imagination, she expresses sowing the seed, the sperm metaphor, in her world the Christ power of spirit from within herself. The adults around her cannot see God with their human eye, so they assume it is all make-believe, hence the truth in plain sight. You make yourself believe by playing through your living imagination and expressing these qualities as a state of being in the present moment, acting as if the outer circumstances reflect your imagination right now. Not at some distant time in the future, not in some off-in-the-future moment when you figure it out through the reasoning mind and its six degrees of separation, who, what, where, when, why, and how. This false starting point implies you begin with an error and end up at a correction. Faulty reasoning begins with error and attempts to correct the deficiency within the same mind pattern of asking questions the mind has no answer for with its ignorance. Next, the human mind beats you up for not knowing the answer. Computing this way is directly opposed to the laws of electricity and magnetism which govern the universe. Harmony forever establishes itself in an, order, in an orderly living deity wherein no mistake can find lodgment or a place to rest. Like forces attract and the devil, ignorance and fear, has no place to find rest. This truth implies that there is no human mind or source of wickedness, albeit in shadows of ignorance that sweep the earth looking for a host. The Gospel of Truth in the Nag Hammadi Library expounds on this idea, stating, When morning comes, this one knows that the fear which he had experienced was nothing. Thus they were ignorant of the Father. He is the one whom they did not see since there had been fear and confusion for a lack of confidence and double-mindedness and division, there were many illusions which were conceived by him, the foregoing, as well as empty ignorance, as if they were fast asleep and found themselves a prey to troubled dreams. Within the passage itself, you identify the steps to sin consciousness. Fear, confusion, a lack of confidence, double-mindedness, division. As children of God, we exist in the idea of man in the mind of God as his perfect expression. When we change the way we look at our self-identity and body, shifting it from flesh and matter to spirit, and reflecting only those qualities that God knows about himself, we discover the kingdom of heaven. We become the ray worshiping the sun as in the children or offspring of the living imagination in spirit that knows no darkness or deficiency. It states, let God be true, but every man a liar, in Romans 3 verse 4. Since God kicked matter, the sponsoring mind of lies, out of heaven, it means those ideas perpetuated from this original sin are bound in the realm of matter. All sin, sickness, disease, including poverty, exist in the flesh and outer realm of matter. Therefore, spirit and matter never intersect or coincide with one another. You cannot mix error with truth. Adultery is when you communicate to and fro by division, whereby ideas unlike each other copulate. As you read above in the steps to sin consciousness, by the time one reaches division in thought, she has already progressed through fear, confusion, a lack of confidence, and double-mindedness. I had a prophetic dream in my late 20s one early morning where I was half asleep. In the vision, the Bible opened up and God revealed Romans 8 verse 10 to me. But if Christ be in you, 
The body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. At first glance, I was terrified due to the observing of this scripture from the eyes of a mortal. To all human senses, if your body is dead, it means you're no longer with your loved ones and are deceased. During this experience of witnessing this prophetic vision, I had been sickly for quite some time and quite terrified I would die. Years later, after completely being healed from what matter declared to be Lyme disease and going through months of living in a bedridden state, I gained new wisdom. The scripture says that when you are righteous, observing God's thoughts towards his perfect man, that's what righteous means. Your idea of a body is never in the world of matter. Ah, big difference. I'll repeat that. When you are righteous, observing God's thoughts towards his perfect man, your idea of a body is never in the world of matter. You have to put to death the old man and are born anew in Christ. You do not identify with flesh, bone, blood, circulation, pulse, heart, lungs, eyes, brain, and all pagan sorcery that binds man to matter through the cross, air, water, earth, and fire. The number five represents the resurrecting power of the living Christ through the reclaiming of ether. Spirit is a better word. Coincidentally, as the world stage broke down in 2020, it is no mystery why the blockchain that they call Genesis Tech goes by the name Ethereum. You leave the world of lies, opinions, and matter to put Jesus to the test instead. Right now, you can begin to contemplate your existence as a fixed and permanent idea in the mind of God. No mistake or material condition called matter can infringe on your birthright as a son or descendant of God. When you learn to rely wholly on spirit to meet your human needs, you gain trust in God and other people too. You realize that you are the source of what comes into your experience by choosing your attitude and focus. You reflect God the good or push against life by human will and arrogance rooted in lack, want, and lusts of the flesh. You never left heaven. You only fell asleep within ideas of matter or ignorance of the Father. Once you recapture your inner childlike essence and consciously apply this wisdom, you mature through receiving the grace of the Father. Eventually, you achieve nirvana, or the highest esoteric knowledge all secret societies call Genesis. Picture in your mind the letter G in the square encompasses Masonic symbol. The highest understanding is that it implies Genesis. You activate the highest form of faith, trust, when you rely entirely on God to provide for your every need, turning within to the Christ and calling on His name, I Am. The I Am presence within is the doorway to spiritual fulfillment and your true self. Like Jesus, your obedience to God is to carry your cross and die to the world of fashion form, the idea that you live in flesh, bone, blood, heart, lungs, etc., and rise in thought to a new idea, the fact that you reflect God, spirit, imagination. Your life is forever held intact by the eternal I Am Presence, and never for a moment have you lived in a fallen condition of temporal, material flesh. You become what you contemplate. As you begin considering ideas of immortality, immutable I am presence within, and spiritual reflection of Christ as your life, expressed as all sufficiency in all things, you cease fearing. As you know, Jesus, the man of flesh, died on the cross. A cross is symbolic of four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. 
These are the binding forces that Lucifer uses to try and become like God, counterfeiting spirit imagination with matter illusion. Hence, the sperm and egg represent Lucifer's idea, who capitalizes on the material plane. Satan was given dominion over the material earth and carries jurisdiction over the man of the flesh. For this reason, Jesus rebuked Peter in Luke 4 verse 8 to try, for trying to stop him from embracing the cross in obedience to God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The cipher in this scripture reveals that you have to die to mortal beliefs in this world. The idea that you exist in an outer realm of matter and material flesh, a time-space illusion of the five material senses, are nothing but a sleep state of ignorance. Consequently, one rises in spirit out of the dream by coming to the Father through Christ, the only way to the Father. John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. According to human opinion, it is not fact but error, therefore it is what I call mortal fiction. You were once a sperm who got lucky and reached an egg. Lucifer mimics truth with a counterfeit version of reality. Material creation. Accepting the substitute for the real, you fell asleep in the dream of the five material senses. Soon, adults conditioned you out of your childlike playful essence and connection to the living imagination. God never occupies a fallen state of matter and becomes less than whole or holy. Completeness, the living imagination or Christ, never suffers a deficiency or shares authority with the other aeon. Since all life within omnipresence itself, it is within omnipresence itself, you cannot exist in matter. It is impossible. Perfect harmony remains intact at every point in the universe. Otherwise, the whole of creation would break at its weakest point. Deepen this awareness by understanding this passage from the Gospel of Truth in the Nag Hammadi Library. Since perfection of the all is in the Father, it is necessary for the all to ascend to him. Therefore, if one has knowledge, he gets what belongs to him and draws it to himself. For he who is ignorant is deficient, and it is a great deficiency, since he lacks that which will make him perfect. Since the perfection of the all is in the Father, it is necessary for the all to ascend to him and for each one to get the things which are his. He registered them first, having prepared them to be given to those who came from him. The deficiency is a belief in matter, believing you grew in a womb and came down a canal. Next, your mother handed you over to a dock. At last, you have a corporate name, all capital letters, on a birth certificate, all these terms, canal, dock, birth, manifest, are all representative of maritime law. Maritime law is the law of the sea, ships and cargo, vessels in dry dock. Jesus walked on water. Therefore, examine the mystery riddle in Luke 8, verse 24 and 25. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Your real life in spirit is forever undisturbed by the sea, the outer realm aeon, with its mortal fiction opinions, counterfeiting life with falsehood and trickery. In other words, 
in ignorance, man is asleep by surrendering to the outer world senses of sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. He is merely cargo or sperm, traveling through time and space across shipping lanes, shipwrecked, abandoned in a foreign vessel in dry dock, a womb. Superstition beguiles man in a captive state of delusion at every turn, deceived by his five material senses. The world system deems this man is dead and lost at sea, a corpse carrying a corporate entity name in all capital letters, your uppercase name on your birth certificate, with a corporeal meat suit, enslaved in a shipping war, traveling across sea lanes. Perhaps that went way over your head, and that's okay. However, at the innermost level, I felt all these things when I was a young boy. In my estimation, something was very dark and sinister about the world around me and all the so-called leaders and esteemed professional parasites. Why did I feel this way? I trusted my instincts. The scowls on the faces of all the people who were ruling over others revealed they lacked joy. Life was not flourishing the nearer you orbited their energy fields. It was almost like a vampire sucked the happiness right out of life, exchanging it for fear, dread, and hate. Naturally, I found my refuge under the shadow of the Almighty. The psalmist decrees this refuge as a surety and safe haven in Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. I would escape the humdrum living of the mundane and sad adults around me, refusing to let go of my childlike essence. Growing up this way was an extraordinary experience observing free-thinking children I was friends with becoming adults, compliments of 12 years of indoctrination camps. By the time they matured in years, they remained bound to the outer aeons because of pride, arrogance, and fear of losing social status and acceptance. Now adulterated in their neocortex, I recall many of my former friends once called me stupid for opting out of the public fool system. They believed my lack of concern over getting good grades and attending indoctrination camps meant I lived riotously, according to their earth guides. On the contrary, living riotously as the prodigal son did, is to bind yourself to the ways of the material world, beginning with the first cause, believing you were born in the flesh. You see, while others were choosing conformity to this world, I was falling asleep in class and daydreaming. When it intrigued me, I would study and get excellent marks. Anything that I became passionate about was easy to excel at learning. Therefore, I knew it was not a condition of lack or aptitude, but contempt. I held their system in contempt, for it felt disharmonious and oppressed. Consequently, I kept living out my dreams, and I noticed others around me were either baffled or confused. How could I defy the normalization of such structured impositions and get ahead? What does she see in you? I remember this little guy named Tim. He was angry because Maggie wanted to date me and not him. He tells me to my face that I'm stupid and he cannot see why she would want a loser like me as a boyfriend. Of course, Tim was the all-A student who thought very highly of his importance in the classroom. It turns out he grew up to work in a retail store and hey, more power to him, I guess. All right. But over the years, you see, many haters would argue as I pulled the hottest girl in school one year after being ridiculed for having acne all over my face as a nobody freshman. They had to deal with a reality where my ways made no sense to them. Seemingly aloof, the loudspeaker would congratulate me for having my name in the newspaper after a recent hockey game, or I was skipping school and getting away with it starting first string in the hockey game on the weekend. I invested more time falling asleep in my pictured desired outcome than beckoning for a pat on the back from the guy barely making a living in the front of the classroom. My favorite teacher was the football coach who was about to retire. He too would fall asleep in class. I would come to his history class because we were on the same page. My rebellious attitude towards so-called authority kept me reflecting on what brought me joy.
and I was somehow getting rewarded for following this inner guidance. It defied the logic of the day that one should endure and conform to this world. I would be doing you a disservice if I did not digress and reveal the story of how I landed the affection of Jennifer, the hottest girl in my high school. She was a senior and I was a sophomore. All the guys on my team wanted to get with her. This carried lifetime bragging rights. She was a real beauty and, well, let us say my previous year of pain as a freshman became my blessing as a sophomore. Your gift is often your curse, and your curse is often your blessing. Back pacing to the beginning of my freshman year, I found myself having the most horrendous acne on my face. My friends even laughed at me and called me mafail. Fail means ugly in Spanish. I was a nobody freshman year, and it hurt. To make matters worse, my grandfather just died a year earlier. I had not gotten over that sting yet. He was my masculine figure after my dad left when I was three years old. Grandpa was my male support in a world where being macho was required. My hockey days revolved around being brave and playing up a level or two with older kids. Grandpa always challenged me this way. He was from Spain and possessed a no-nonsense persona that accepted no excuses, kind of like a Dan Pena, if you know who I'm talking about. When my grandpa died, I lost myself in a depression I was not sure would ever end. I recall stuffing the pain down so much so that I could not speak for months. It began the summer after 8th grade. My face got so ugly with acne that I could no longer looking at myself without rage or crying. It was awful enduring the self-hate that was developing inside of my troubled mind. I used to ride my bike every day and night to get my aggression out with all the heartache and feeling alone in the world. Little did I realize, but the weight of the world was punishing me for looking to it for answers. Quite a bit of blame for the death of my grandfather fell on my shoulders. I got scolded for stressing him out with my rebellious attitude. In actuality, when he became ill and the cancer sores appeared all over his skin, I refused to play hockey and go outside. All I wanted to do was sit in my room and play guitar. I knew he was going to leave and it broke my heart. It meant that I would be alone. Grandpa wrote me a letter explaining how he loved me and that I would be coming into my manhood. He urged me to make good choices. He knew it was his time and the tone of the letter said it all. Right before his death, I went to the hospital and he took my grandmother in his arms and he said, Make sure Matthew lives his dreams. Grandpa left suddenly, and his legacy lived on through me for all these years. Zero excuses and living from the place of dreaming, achieving, and giving the best of oneself in every venue. However, while I was processing the pain of his sudden departure, my first interaction with the voice of God occurred. I'll tell you about it right now. A few nights after his death, I sat in my bedroom staring out the window at the stars. I felt Grandpa present with me. As I turned on the radio, the song, Silent Lucidity from Queensryche, was beginning to play. I was a ball of tears for the second time since Grandpa got sick. Until this time, I had stuffed emotion to appear macho. The last time occurred at the church service where the pastor asked me to share a few words about Grandpa. I stood up and I could not speak, just cry. Many nights following Grandpa leaving, I would ride my bike up to Oldbrick Hill and smash it down on the grass, tossing it with force to bang it up and yet avoid ruining it, and I would punch the grass beneath, throwing fits of anger and rage were my only outlet because I felt no place of belonging anymore in this world. Laughed at daily and ridiculed for the acne on my face, while dealing with the sudden loss, devastated me to the point of self-abuse. I would sometimes hit myself in the head so hard that lumps would emerge and blood on my knuckles. It was a dark period of my journey in processing the pain of abandonment, isolation, self-hate, and loads of frustration. The cruel world out there bound me in my ignorance. I succumbed by conforming to human sight and trusting in the lies therein. I believed the lie about the physical appearance I saw in the mirror. 
combined with lies about being abandoned as well as lies about life being temporal. My grandfather could no more depart from my life any more than a favorite song from my memory. Fortunately, a divine intervention happened one sunny day while I was amid another rage of anger. That night after riding my bike to overkill again, I audibly heard a voice in my head as I was yelling, I fucking hate you, God. I was so angry that I wanted to die. The I am presence emerged from within me and calmed me instantly. I heard the words as deep and penetrating, an audible voice in my head, say it as you want it to be, say I am. Now, you may be thinking this is crazy, but I assure you, this was real. So I said, I am lean, sexy, and gorgeous, and all the girls want me. It was very egotistical, and yet it felt so damn good to say it. I felt a glimpse of peace and inner guidance. I knew what to do at that moment. From that experience, I immediately disregarded my facial appearance. The observation that girls laughed at me and I relentlessly became embarrassed in public by my facial acne was no longer a threat. It was as if the living God made a cameo appearance and introduced himself. The I am presence came forth to intercede. That's what I felt inside and I knew this was instant knowledge of what to do. It just shifted my mind in a second and I began applying this to my circumstances immediately. From that moment forward, every time even the slightest suggestion or thought from within my mind was discordant, I called upon the name of God. I repeated the I am affirmation with all my focus on the words as I, was, I would count 25 to 100 times on my hands. Anything that perturbed my emotional state triggered me to immediately begin counting with my fingers murmuring beneath my breath or affirming out loud, depending on whether I was alone or in public. I am lean, sexy, and gorgeous, and all the girls want me. I am lean, sexy, and gorgeous, and all the girls want me. I am lean, sexy, and gorgeous, and all the girls want me. I just went on and on. I kept doing this new strategy for a few months, using every negative thought or impression from my outer world to turn water into wine. It was a new habit. I could escape the world of pain out there by immersing myself in the constant repetition of this statement at every interaction where I felt even a twinge of discord. Fast forward. I had been doing this new behavior for months, and eventually it faded out of my routine. New experiences were emerging that brought about the Word of God, calling on the I Am Presence becoming the flesh, as the Bible declares. By this time, a friend had already introduced me to Accutane, it's an acne drug, and after one round, my face cleared up entirely. I was now handsome. Hence, the triggers of outer discord no longer appeared to cause me to begin counting on my fingers and repeating my I am affirmation. I had called on God through his name and received my miracle. All this effort into overlaying the mental patterns in my mind and using my living imagination while drifting off to sleep at night, released an unstoppable force in my world. Soon after, the following school year arrived, and before the hockey season even began, Bob Suter, my coach, had nominated me as one of the top stars on the varsity team. My ego was thrilled with the write-up in the newspaper, naturally. You can imagine this gave me street cred for potential girls and the respect of others who escalated my popularity quickly. Racing ahead several more months, I met a girl, fell in love, and ended up becoming a monster chick magnet with so many girls wanting me that I could barely keep up. It was too much sauce for my new relationship, <laughs> and we broke up so often that I care not to remember that soap opera. But through it all, I ended up having a daughter that came into the world with this girl that I fell in love with during high school. Calling on the name of God, I am, combined with the immediate dismissal of any discordant thoughts, literally transformed every aspect of my human experience. My appearance became radiantly attractive. My social status elevated to the top of the heap when it came to being a popular jock. My love life was overflowing with more girls offering me attention than I could handle. 
Through the conscious use of the I am presence within and the living Christ imagination, I used my human will to call into expression a world that I desired. I will share one final victory that emerged due to putting this force to work, operating through the constant repetition of the I am affirmation and falling asleep in occupying my desired outcome. During a locker room talk one early morning at a 5.45 a.m. morning hockey practice, I told everyone that I would be the guy who Jennifer would want. As mentioned, she was the talk of many guys. By this time, I had convinced myself beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was attractive and she would desire me. When I never, I never envisioned Jennifer and me together. The force in me was intense. I found out it is when you want to be with yourself that others do too. By this time, I enjoyed my presence, for I knew it was God doing the work in my life. That week, I walked up to Jennifer by her locker during a break. She was standing there, and I asked her if she had plans for the weekend. She smiled as we made eye contact. It was the first time I had ever been that close to her or even looked in her eyes. It felt comfortable and natural to approach her, and she was surprisingly flattered. Jennifer asked, What do you have in mind? I replied, it is my birthday this weekend and I want to invite you to come to my game. I want, I want to see you there and I want to get to know you. Jennifer came to watch me play on my birthday weekend and it blew everyone away. A sophomore just captured the interest of the most desirable senior girl in the whole school. I came into the world living my entire life so far by these principles and every time I lost touch with my inner power, Things got dicey or they fell apart. You see, my ways were always mystical and outside of the status quo. To all outside observers, my life represents the folly of Bill Murray's character Wally in the movie The Man Who Knew Too Little. From sleeping in class to skipping class to going to the gym instead or studying Tantra at the mall, my actions appeared to make little sense to rational minds. Some people took offense to my behavior, but I knew it was not wrong because it brought about my, jo my joy and harmed nobody. I did whatever I wanted, and most of the time you would find me following the fastest path to my excitement regardless of the fallout. People wondered how I seemed to get all the lucky breaks while I was self-governing my life from within rule sets they could not comprehend. I was relying on the supernatural, not the natural. Living in my imagination, the Christ, and calling on God, the I am presence within, to the exclusion of all conflicting and contrary evidence from the world, as my modus operandi. Every time I stopped doing this consciously, things would break down. I became drunk in the world, bound to the outer aeons, and I would have to start anew. The cares of the world must grow strangely dim to harness this force, for unbeatable advantages in your life. When you allow the cares of this world to take over, you are succumbing to error and illusion, captive as a prisoner in the Middle Kingdom. I recall the bliss of sitting in study hall or detention once in a while. I found it to be a blessing. Suddenly, I had an entire school day to pour out my emotions and write poetry, getting lost in the moment. You see, that was an early initiation for what I am presently doing here and now. I have been at this writing nonstop for hours upon hours already. Do you see with hindsight how following my highest excitement and the fastest path to my joy led me to experiences that benefit, benefited me along the way? By now, you should be eager to try this way of living for yourself. The highest form of faith is trust. You must first trust yourself, the wisdom within that is your life, to walk by faith. Faith produces miracles, whereas logic does not. I have a complete training on my homepage website at MatthewDavidHurtado.com that will teach you how to live in this manner, building trust at every new level of support you receive, the universe provides. This training is called the 3 to one Prosperity Formula. Even when life offered me resistance that appeared to obstruct my path, it was another opportunity to learn or develop a new necessary skill. You see, everything happens for you. Most people assume things are happening to them. Life is happening through you and for you, 
It is your choice to embrace it or remain stifled in human reason and doubt. Let me share an example of how this played out in my experience. When school teachers cautioned me against falling asleep in class or blatantly walking out, not returning after a bathroom break, I negotiated with the teachers. I said to each one, look, I'm going to have to play in the hockey games and I want out of this class just as much as you don't want me here sleeping. What's it going to take? In every circumstance, I agreed to pass the final exam with no more disrespect to the teacher or myself for that matter. In other words, I would not show up and I had to pass their final exam. It may not have been the honorable way in the eyes of the academic crowd. Still, I was learning negotiation with the teachers and devoted students to pass my exams. I graduated out of there without being held back. It was win-win. I learned how to always allow them to give you what you desire in the result by giving them a win. This discovery is a life skill that class did not offer, and yet I learned it by talking my way out of the classroom. From my perspective, history, biology, and many other subjects were a complete waste of my time. For some students, it paid off to learn those subjects, but it had nothing to do with my excitement, and I trusted my inner guidance. I felt my destiny had nothing to do with the majority of those teachings. Aside from that, being around others as a square peg in a round hole just sucked. While, <clears throat> while I obtained jock popularity in school for my athletic abilities, I always felt best when stillness and silence became my teachers. Today, thankfully, the new normal has exposed how necessary it is to reinvent learning without industrial age ideas of classroom style memorization. Most traditional schooling is merely a regurgitation of useless data that is mostly contrived fiction and propaganda. Conquerors wrote history. Without all the suffering that accompanies conformity, I lived a joy-filled romance novel meshed with a sports story that feels compelling enough to share in this book. Again, stillness and silence were my best teachers. In them, I trust. To this day, I continue to draw from the same power to live out my dreams as I have advanced throughout several decades of clock time. First, you have to know that the resurrecting power, the Christ, is your living imagination. You exist in Christ, not a material body. You rid yourself of every false imagining wherein your thoughts rest upon matter and material claims. This stand you must take includes all evidence, even a moment ago in time, as false sense. Disregard all the ideas you broke material laws by suffering a fall, an old injury, or whatever past <clears throat> alleges as accurate. You cannot and will not ever live in the past or future. For example, a few moments ago, my mind told me that stress had caused tension in my head, resulting in a headache. I turned within to my holy self, the I am presence within, and declared that life is spirit eternal in this moment and never even a moment ago. Life emerges at this moment as a flawless and perfect spiritual reflection which God knows no material law to obstruct the harmony and goodness of the allness of God. Second, you have to call on His name, I Am, the presence within. Rebuke the claims of material sense and any of its supposed impositions upon your life. For example, if you appear overweight in the mirror and feel discord when seeing your reflection, know that the reflection in that mirror is not and has never been the real you. Instead, you turn to the I am presence within and make a firm stand on what you choose to settle in your heart. I am now at my perfect weight, looking good and feeling great. Consider your ideal self in your living imagination and carry forward as expressing your joy from this place. You seize control of this moment and you have reclaimed the victory at hand. The stranglehold of society lies in the institutions built by neocortex people who erect universities, conditioning groupthink over independent free thinking and imagination. Satan controls the world of matter. Lucifer, being the architect of the matrix, takes the light of man and mimics divine creation with an artificial substrate of living through the material five senses. All neocortex, walking by human sight, 
is via five sense observation, leaving the creator out of his creation. Men build upon the evidence of their senses by heaping on piles of heavy learning. Eventually, they know everything about nothing and accomplish nothing with everything still contained inside of themselves. Humbling oneself to surrender control of everything outside of this moment collapses the time-space delusion. Little men with giant egos always want to control others and gain power over other people. Wise men relinquish, relinquish this control to the Creator and establish a firm trust in life instead. Looking to false idols from outside oneself is the most common trap that binds men to sin and death. Jesus warned his disciples against this idea in Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The idea that you live in a material meat suit and believe that life is contained in the world of material fashion form is a lie from the beginning, from the vanity of wicked men. The world of form is a dream and delusion of the five senses. Romans 8 describes this best in the first two lines. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, or the outer aeons. Even the churches deceive you. They teach that the flesh man of Jesus is the living Son of God. The Gospel of Philip in the Nag Hammadi Library states, When a blind man and one who sees are both together in darkness, they are no different from one another. When the light comes, the one who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in darkness. The Lord said, Blessed is he who is before he came into being, for he who is has been and shall be. If you read that closely, it explains what I'm telling you. As soon as one looks outside of herself for a deity, she binds herself in the middle place or reasoning mind. In my favorite book in the Nag Hammadi Library, The Gospel of Truth, these words are written. This ignorance of the Father brought about terror and fear, and terror became dense like a fog that no one was able to see. Because of this, error became strong, but it worked on its fashion substance vainly, because it did not know the truth. It was in a fashioned form while it was preparing in power and in beauty the equivalent of truth. This, then, was not a humiliation for him, that an eliminable, inconceivable one, for they were as nothing, this terror and this forgetfulness and this figure of falsehood. Whereas the established truth is unchanging, unperturbed, and completely beautiful. For this reason, do not take error too seriously. Thus, since it had no root, it was in a fog, as regards the Father, engaged in preparing works and forgetfulness and fears in order by these means to beguile those of the middle and to make them captive. The forgetfulness of error was not revealed. It did not become light beside the Father. Forgetfulness did not exist with the Father, although it existed because of Him. What exists in Him is knowledge, which was revealed so that forgetfulness might be destroyed and that they might know the Father. Since forgetfulness existed because they did not know the Father, if they then come to know the Father, from that moment on forgetfulness will cease to exist. Looking out there to the realm of winter, judging by human sight, is the fall of man. Human minds are wired by the mark of the beast, the 666. In other words, they become carnally minded and operate from their deficiency in a dead vessel identification versus the fullness of spirit imagination. The 666 is the six degrees of separation through the three kingdoms. You think this way when asking yourself who, what, where, when, <laughs> why, or how. In essence, the same human mind that perceives a problem where none exists is distancing you away from truth within. Your identification with the time-space delusion sends you on a journey off on a quest, a question, in ignorance of the Father. You cannot solve the problems in life with the same mind that is creating them. 
Instead of holding perfection in thought, the illimitable, inconceivable one, established in unchanging truth, when man identifies himself in the world of matter, he becomes captive as a creature of forgetfulness until he knows the Father of Light. The inner kingdom is your living imagination, also known as the Christ. This place is always in now space. It is the fullness of the Father of Light. It is your eternal salvation. Your middle kingdom is where the rulers bind you by the power of Satan through the reasoning mind and the fall of man, 666, who, what, where, when, why, and how, questioning. Your purpose for this computer brain is to choose the thoughts of God, not the wicked ideas of mortals. Your outer kingdom is the realm of time-space illusion, a dream of the five human senses, where the terror became dense like a fog. Therefore, the booby trap of this world is to seek approval from places of power and prestige. In 2020, it became apparent with the masking of the entire world that if you aren't spiritually minded and rooted in wisdom, Wisdom, you may be uncertain of how to trust other people and trust God. Knowing what these Gnostic Gospels teach and applying the knowledge for a direct experience of God's all-protecting power is how you gain trust again. No power on earth is capable of subduing the mighty I Am presence of the living God within you and His Son, your living imagination. The path of resistance is the path of human reason. It is all the hell you could ask for if you like to suffer. It is a dreaded fairy tale to seek answers in your outer when trickery and deceitfulness are men's ways on the earth and precisely why the Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. If you want to extrapolate the supernatural benefits of adhering to the scripture, you have to know what it is you're reading. God cre- never, God never created a material man. Satan did. You turn within, using the same strategies I'm describing, and discover the hidden Christ that the world knew not. The scriptures reveal the exact process I have been mentioning in this chapter. Let me give you a simple instruction. Use the ABC break process and add your favorite music to inseminate the realm of winter with your new vibrational offering. You'll think from having instead of wanting. And new ideas will emerge. You find yourself solution-based for your outward action. Therefore, reaping your ideal harvest in the summer. Later in this book, when you learn the self-entrainment technique, you'll discover how to be in control of your vibrational resonance. You're going to learn the mechanics of the highest level of sorcery. S-O-U-R-C-E-R-Y. As in being the source of the good you seek, releasing it from within yourself on this planet. In summary... Let us recap a few points. The I am presence within is God. The Son of God is the living Christ, the imagination, the Holy Spirit. Son means descendant, likeness. Therefore, if you are made in God's image and likeness, you must be spirit and imagination. You never lived in a material body. You have no more life in flesh than you do a street pole. You're dreaming, O Adam. Now, It is time to rise. Awake from your dream.